Strategic planning might seem complicated, but it doesn't need to be. Empower Envision facilitates collaboration, helping you strategize and execute your business plan more efficiently, saving time and money. Featuring interactive strategy dashboards, powerful visualization tools, and real-time communication, Empower Envision meets you where you are, where you work, and where you plan. Don't just create a strategy, see it happen. Learn more about how Empower Envision can help your organization today. I'm based in New York, and I was there when the COVID outbreak hit. And one of the most amazing things in, in the midst of all that darkness was this habit at seven o'clock every night, the entire city stepped out on their doorstops, on their balconies, and gave a two minute round of applause for our healthcare workers. If you didn't know it already, I think everybody knows now how crucial that industry is to all of us, and how important it is to get the transformations in that industry right. We're gonna have a panel discussion on that now. We're gonna delve into a conversation with some leading healthcare thinkers. And we're gonna have an opening statement by Benan Tabrisi, a Stanford professor and the author of the Brightline Transformation Compass to kick things off. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope you'll enjoy this. And Benan, the word is yours. Hi, I'd like to talk about three areas with the frontline employees. Number one, I'd like to invite everyone to honor them. Number two, I'd like to propose frontline as a lever of transformation. And number three, I'd like to discuss how can we unleash the full potential of the frontline employees in your organizations. Let's honor them. Let's honor the frontline, especially the ones who've been working on the healthcare industry. I'd like you to take you back to the early part of the pandemic. As you recall, our healthcare professionals didn't have enough PPE, face shields, or masks, and they often had to go to local stores and come up with creative ways to save their lives. I asked a senior physician in a hospital to share with me his experiences with the early part of the pandemic. This is what he told me, quote, I had a young primary care physician who early on in the pandemic saw a patient with a sore throat. He initially thought it was a strep throat. So he took a swab from the throat and he found out it was a COVID-19. Unfortunately, a week later, the patient died. The senior doctor told me that the young doctor called him and said, doctor, am I going to live? I told him, I don't know. I don't even know how to treat this, but we'll do everything we can to save you. Fortunately, the young doctor survived and went back helping the most vulnerable population who had the highest share of the COVID-19 in terms of patients. What I'd like to share with you is another story that the senior doctor shared with me. I remember a doctor who had a son with leukemia and the son was going through chemotherapy. She would go home and outside the house, she would use disinfectant to be able to enter the house completely afraid of infecting the child while having to do the housework of educating the child, feeding the family and everything else and showing up at work every day. When organizations name essential workers, what they mean is frontline employees, it's grocery clerks, pharmacists, delivery people, people who make our food, people who work in the labs, who test for COVID-19 and work on the cure for COVID-19. They are the angels of our modern time. 
they were involved with the all out war on an invisible enemy. We need to honor them the way we honor our military. We need to make sure we financially take care of them. Ultimately, we need to learn from our mistakes. Now I'm going to talk about frontline as a key lever of transformation. In my research with the Rapid Transformation book, what I found is that over 70% of organizational transformation lead to failure. And I see frontline employees as the most untapped resources in the organization. If you look at a company like Walmart, Sam Walton used to visit the, the, the Walmart stores around the country on a weekly basis, engage the employees and ask a lot of questions. IKEA furniture was an idea that was started from the front line. Entrepreneurs who are the engine of our growth, of our economic growth, succeed because of their zero distance to the front line. In the past 20 years, no other group has endured the profound pain and the hardship that the frontline employees have endured. You know, when you think about the visit that you have to the Apple store or getting something from the Amazon store, our, our consumers are now demanding more and more from our frontline employees and they're subject of a lot of hardship, not just from the customers, but also from oftentimes misalignment in the communication with the front line. If you imagine a large organization, a combination of CEO, let's say 10 direct reports, they spend a maximum of around 2000 hours a month at work. Five level down, which is a typical hierarchy of the organization, you actually have 200 millions of hours that are actually spent at work. Thus, Thus, I would bet any day on the collective IQ of the frontline. Frontline are what I call the Cassandras of organization, which in Greek mythology is a prophetess during the Trojan War, whose prediction always came true. They are the canaries in the cold mine, and they could give the organization early warnings about the disruption that are happening in the marketplace. The question is, now the third question is, how do we actually uh, unleash the potential of the frontline employees? This is really described in the, at the Brightline Transformation Compass uh, website, which I developed with Project Management Institute, which is the culmination of my Rapid Transformation book and the Inside Out Effect books. The most important thing first is what I call, call the inside out effect. The inside out effect aligns the heart, what goes on in the heart and soul of every employee in the organization to the North Star of the organization. It's really drawing out the human magic. It's about really what, what, what it's about really creating a, a dialogue between the executives and also the frontline employees so that they could really connect from a visceral level. In the working se sessions I had with the frontline healthcare workers during the COVID, we've had quite a bit of conversation about the hardship that we're going through. I recall one of the doctors who went to a local uh, place for a vacation, she actually dialed into these sessions because she told me that these sessions give her a peace of mind and it helped her a lot. So we had some amazing uh, feedback about these type of sessions in terms of the inside out effect. The, uh, the other thing that I also share with you, why it's important to have this inside out effect conversation is that studies have shown that the rate of depression, clinical depression has increased by about 100, over 100% during the COVID period. Second part is what I call a rapid transformation. In the rapid transformation model, you have rapid response teams. And the key here is to have the frontline employees involved in these rapid response team, create a flat organization where there's a zero distance between the executives and the frontline, and really be able to engage them, ask them to co-author the change, 
and also find the future talents within the organization. Finally, what I'd like to propose is that let's elevate the status of the front line by not just enabling them to reach their full potential, but inviting them to co-author a future for your organization. Let's be kind and compassionate toward the frontline employees while speaking truth to the powerful, while being grounded with listening to the ground floor. Welcome all to this panel regarding transformation on the front lines, a perspective from healthcare. Thank you, Professor Tabrizi, for the opening statement. We'll be coming back to COVID. Of course, we'll continue today to unlock the truth about transformation. And I'm joined by Matt Bell, who leads global portfolio and project management at AstraZeneca, reporting directly to the CEO. I'm also joined by Michael Klein, Senior Director of Portfolio Management and Operations Planning at Mayo Clinic. We also work to have a female voice on this panel. And as we're talking about Frontline, uh, she couldn't be with us uh, today, so we'll have time to catch up. Of course, without uh, further ado, let us start the topic of this discussion. And today, we want to uncover the truth about transformation, looking specifically on uh, healthcare. So the first question that I have for you, Matt, here, uh, can you talk about what transformations are happening in the healthcare system? Yeah, well, thanks so much for the question, and great to be here with Michael, and we're looking forward to a great discussion. Um, look, I think this is a, a fascinating topic. It's quite clear that we're going through tremendous change um, this year, precipitated by COVID, but we were already on that tremendous change curve, uh, change curve before that. And I think about healthcare right now and some of the things that we're, we're dealing with and adapting to, COVID is essentially accelerating. And I, I, kinda, I think I see two or three big trends, at least that we're thinking about in the company that I work for. One, of course, is digital transformation, right? Digital uh, data technology, it continues to play an ever bigger role in our individual lives, in how companies work, in how health systems work. And I think actually the COVID experience has only accelerated that. And it's not only changing how we can discover drugs, how we understand science, it's changing how we work, how we bring medicines to patients, and it's changing how we interact with physicians and payers as well. So for me, one of the big themes around transformation in healthcare is the sort of digital transformation in the broadest sense. The second, of course, is uh, the underlying science. The core of what we do in pharmaceuticals is to develop medicines for patients, and that always rests on really strong uh, science. And I think we continue to see great progress, actually, scientifically. We see new platforms. You know, we're evolving from traditional small molecules, biologics, and vaccines, so all kinds of interesting molecules and interventions uh, for diseases, and we're seeing underlying science progress at really a fantastic pace that opens up opportunities for the future and then last but not least i think we see society changing around us um you know covid's this year illustrated how we're starting to think different about the workplace what it means what it means to be an employee where you work the sort of employee uh company contract and i think those trends were beginning um years ago but they've only become accelerated this year so lots of differences in sort of how society is thinking about um, work, the place of the employee in there, the role of government uh, in uh, healthcare, I think is also shifting. So those would be sort of the, my three headlines, uh, digital transformation, underlying science transformation, and the evolution of society, both individually and the role of government in it. Wonderful. Uh, thank you, Matt. Michael, anything would you add? Sure. Um, so Mayo Clinic focuses really on three areas. Uh, we have our practice, which is direct patient care, and then education and research. And all three have been affected pretty dramatically by the changes that we've seen recently. Um, from the practice perspective, uh, we've seen a dramatic increase uh, in the movement to telehealth, in the shifting from, uh, you know, kind of on-site patient care to having people who are seen uh, by a remote physician or care practitioner. 
And so that's been a big change. We, we had some expectations uh, in late 2019 about when we expected to see significant changes in, 20 health, in uh, telehealth. And we expected those to take about five to seven years. And if by years we meant months, then we were roughly accurate. Um, so, you know, as Matt mentioned, the kind of digital data and technology realms have significantly uh, affected us as well. And we've been moving forward in a lot of those areas, um, developing the remote work environments for not only our patient care staff, but also our non-patient care staff. So we had to move 30,000 employees to remote work in a matter of weeks. It's something that would have been absolutely unthinkable in probably late 2019 and we had to get that done in a very short period of time and that really uh, brings me to the third piece that we've seen uh, which is agility and not just in the sense of uh, what we call sometimes capital a agile referring to the project management methodology um, but really being flexible and adaptable uh, to new ways of working um, we've had to change a lot of things about how we work, how we interact with teams. Uh, calls like this, for example, are you know becoming the kind of the norm uh, these days, and we have to get used to things like uh, people having exercise equipment in the background, hypothetically speaking, of course, you know, but anyone uh, might have that. And so these types of things are things that we've had to get used to very quickly, and how we've had to think about changing and adapting how we work. Um, and it's been a big adjustment for all of us, but we're all stronger for having done these things. And we're all, I think, able to move more quickly now as a result of uh, understanding that when we have to move, we are able to do so. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Michael. Uh, maybe if I can say, if we go back, let's say in October, this time last year, Nobody has seen, no, no, no one would have seen it. Or of course, there were models predicting that there could be a crisis. People were aware that it was a possibility, but for it to happen so fast and so quick and changing the way we do things, uh, I mean, it caught many people by surprise. Uh, of course, uh, what I would like to hear from you, Matt, because uh, 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 Michael said this stage, in your specific sector of uh, what has COVID-19 meant? COVID meant? What, what, what were the implications for COVID-19 and how you have adapted uh, to this new environment? Yeah, so I mean, great question. And I think that probably many of the themes that uh, we've experienced are very common with, with Michael's organization and, and other non-healthcare organizations. So I mean, there's really been two, two big dimensions for us. Of course, one is how we adapt to different ways of working. Uh, for all the obvious reasons that we know with physical distancing and the lockdowns and we had to sort of very rapidly move to, to virtual working and you know um, it, as Michael explained for Mayo we also moved as everybody did very very quickly and it was surprisingly effective actually it's been surprisingly effective that um, and so for us we've been on a journey and we talk at AstraZeneca about COVID experience being a journey that has an end, by the way, we will beat this thing. We will come out the other end. And so we've tried to frame our experience of ways of working in a journey. There's sort of the initial phase of responding, controlling, adapting to virtual working, doing all the things we had to do in March, April and May to just adapt very quickly. And then there's a phase where we're a little bit in now, it's different by state, it's different by country, where there's a measure of returning to the office, there's a measure of finding a new balance, a sort of a hybrid between working remotely, working physically, trying to make those two things live together. We're a little bit in that world at the moment in, in, in AstraZeneca, but that's new, right? That sort of hybrid way of working. And eventually, of course, we'll be in a place where we're through COVID and we're looking in the rear view mirror. And at that point, the question for us at the moment is, what have we learned from the experience? What can we keep and take with us um, and keep doing because we've discovered ways of working or we've tried things out at scale that we think we should hold on to? And secondly, how do we anticipate the world's going to look different at the end of 21, 22? Clearly, this is going to be lasting from an economic perspective globally, um, but it's also going to change behavior potentially permanently uh, for some people and in, in healthcare. So how do we anticipate those lasting changes um, beyond COVID. So that's sort of piece one. And then the second piece, of course, for us as AstraZeneca has been very rapidly mobilizing to ask, what can we do therapeutically to help, basically? And so we've advanced several programs of vaccine, antibodies, and other things into the pipeline as quickly as possible 
to try and get um, valuable medicines to patients. And we've had to move very, very quickly to do that. So for us, it's been those two, those two experiences. Of course, for all employees, adapting, adapting, and anticipating in the future. Uh, and as a pharmaceutical company, trying to play our role in society to bring, uh, bring a treatment or a cure um, to this pandemic. Thank you so much, uh, Matt, for this uh, reply. And uh, of course, uh, today we heard about uh, three things that you said are affecting uh, transformation here. I heard digital transformation. I heard science. I also heard society. And of course, when we talk about transformation, yes, we are living through uh, the challenges of COVID-19 and it is difficult. It is, I, mean, uh, I mean, nobody has thought about it or the consequences of it. At the same time, there is also transformation that are uh, happening all the time, or bigger other transformations as well. So maybe going back to Michael this time, is if we look at transformation as it's happening, it could be through COVID or through other transformations. And you were mentioning direct patient care. So I wanted us to look at more closely at the patient side of the system. What are these transformations? meaning to patients? Sure, there's a lot to unpack there. So of course, as a uh, care organization, our primary mission is to serve the needs of the patient. The needs of the patient come first, always at Mayo Clinic. And so as we think about that, there are lots of people obviously who are developing symptoms of COVID, who have other health concerns as well. And we need to serve that entire population and we need to be very careful so we had to change some of our safety protocols. We had to invent new ways of working that would allow us to protect the COVID patients, protect our staff, and protect the patients who were there for non-COVID reasons. So there were a lot of constituents to think about as we did that. Um, and at the same time, we need to make sure that we're continuing to develop new treatments, that we're working towards the forefront of developing therapeutics for COVID, of developing ways of testing faster, understanding how we can protect people in the best possible ways. We had to deal with legislative changes associated with COVID and thinking about how that impacted our way of doing business, what it meant for telehealth as previously mentioned. Um, and you know, we had to think about our readiness for future adverse events. So if something like this were to happen again, or if something else were to take place uh, that was an adverse event, how would we deal with it? What have we learned from this that we can reapply? How can we be as adaptable as possible? How can we react very quickly? And then we also needed to consider the cultural implications. Um, and Matt mentioned these uh, for society as well. It's not just about us. It's not just about our employees. It's about how patients and the surrounding communities feel about what we're doing um, and thinking about what this means to people. We're, we're a very mission-driven organization when we have thousands of people who are no longer walking through the halls of a hospital building every day and seeing patients and their families and interacting with them on a regular basis. How do we maintain that connection to the patient care mission? So there were a lot of challenges that we had to think about carefully, and we're still working through some of those because they're going to be ongoing for some time. Thank you, uh, Michael. Let me go back uh, this time to Matt. Of course, when we are looking at treatment and you hear people talking about getting vaccines, there are a lot of testing, there are a lot of uh, organization working on uh, developing vaccine to address the challenge that we, we face. And at the same time, there are the safety protocols and the timing and making sure that the vaccines are fit for purpose and they met all the criteria here. How do you handle this type of uh, dilemma here? Because there is a challenge. We need to make some, some, something fast, quick. At the same time, people want it to be safer. And, uh, and uh, it's quite uh, a dilemma. How, how is uh, the pharmaceutical industry uh, responding to this? I, mean, I think we, it's not an either or, it, it has to be a both, right? So we have to move quickly and move safely and meet the needs of the regulators and our patients, right? And so, you know, I think the only difference is of course time pressure because the world is waiting, you know, in, in this case. Um, but we have to do the right thing. And of course, you know, companies recently sort of signed, the, signed up to that commitment, you know, on being transparent, on doing the right thing. 
of following the regulatory process. So I, I mean, for me, the, the difference here is the time pressure, right? The time pressure. Um, but it doesn't mean we can compromise on anything else, right? We still have to be have the highest uh, level of integrity in the conduct of our studies. We still have to follow the science and follow the data and the choices that we make. And we will do that. I'm sure I speak on behalf of the industry. Then. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, we are all eagerly, eagerly waiting to see that uh, uh, solution uh, kind of coming to the forefront. And of course, I'm sure Michael would be happy to, to see it as well so that uh, they can use it. Uh, now, now, moving on, uh, there is also government intervention uh, in the, within the healthcare system. Of course, we're looking at COVID, but I want it also to be broader. What is, is this meaning for government and how is it helping or maybe not so much helping uh, the healthcare industry? What could government do to facilitate transformations that are happening across the board? Uh, this question will go first to Michael. Sure. I think that one of the, the things that uh, is most helpful for government to do is to partner with the healthcare organizations and to understand their perspectives on uh, what's happening really on the front lines. It's one thing to, to make policies from a position where, yes, you're thinking about the interests of the people, but we really need to discuss with those who are facing it on an everyday basis and uh, people who are, you know, like Matt's organization, uh, making the pharmaceuticals that will help to cure individuals. So I, I think the thing that we need to do is to think about the whole system. It's not just a solution for one group. It has to be something that works for everybody within the system to make sure that we get the best possible outcomes for all of the individuals concerned. It's got to be something that works for the organizations. If the healthcare organizations aren't around, we can't take care of people. Um, and it's got to be obviously something that works for all of the patients and consumers as well. So there's, there's a lot to consider and there are no simple answers uh, for the government regulators who are working to understand how we might make changes going forward. Um, but I think you know, having that perspective from the industry, from the people who are on the front lines is going to be something that's critically important. Thank you. To you now, Matt. Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, governments obviously play a huge role. Um, they set the tone, they can set the agenda, they can provide important messages to, to all the citizens in the country, of what's important and not important, and they can help things um, to happen. So I sort of go back to where I started, really. If you think about the changes and the transformations happening in our world around digital, around more informed patients, or, you know, Michael's talked about remote care and different ways of providing healthcare. I think that we need to all work together to get to a better place in the future where ultimately patients get better care that's more convenient for them and it's cost effective and a good value, right? So I, I think we all, we're all in it together, right? Either the health systems, the governments, the pharmaceutical companies, we've all got a role and I think governments play an important role, of course. I think where I'd like to see the dialogue is, is always on solutions, right? How do we move the experience of patients forward um, so that they get ultimately better treatments and better outcomes um, than they did yesterday. That's always got to be the goal for all of us. Excellent. Uh, thank you for that. And we'll move on and touch one topic as well. Of course, we talk about patient, but there is also the healthcare professionals, the employees that are frontline facing the challenges. And myself, my wife uh, is a nurse and she's on the frontline as well. One day she had a quote, a, a, a quote the, when people were saying, uh, stay home or stay, don't get out. And they say, I mean, as people are staying home, I need to go to work because that's where the challenges are. And, and I need to do something about it. I cannot just sit and watch it happening. It is my duty of care to go to the front lines and uh, to, I mean, care for people that need that care. So thinking about it broadly then in, in, in your uh, in individual companies, or organization, what has been this meant for the, the employees, I mean, for them giving the care, but at the same time associating them through these changes and making sure that there are also uh, a, a, a power in making sure that these changes, I mean, they could adapt to it and uh, they could um, embrace it. And uh, of course, the family is affected as well. So the bigger picture here, when you look at the employees or the healthcare uh, professionals, uh, I'll start with Michael on this one. I, I think it's it's very important to recognize that for employees, this is an incredibly stressful time. That is true for people all over the world, um, but it is especially true for people in the healthcare industry. 
Um, and we need to recognize that these people, especially the people who are working on the front lines, they're, they're everyday heroes. They are people who do remarkable jobs on a daily basis and receive often little in the way of thanks for it. So I think one of the things that we can do is to show gratitude and appreciation for their selflessness and to make sure that we are appreciating everything that they do and how they contribute to the health of others, even when it's not necessarily even directly recognized by the patients and their families. We also need to think about you know, others who work in the healthcare industry. How do we serve as the direct patient care personnel serve? So how can we help them? How can we be in service to them? And how can we help to make sure that they're able to do their best to drive the best possible outcomes for patients? because that could be us. That could be one of our family members who is on that table, who's in that ambulance. And we would wanna make sure that those healthcare professionals have everything that they need and are feeling as good as possible to provide service to patients. Uh, a lot of the things that we're doing have to do with uh, not just employee well-being, which we think of as kind of the, the long-term perspective on how are people feeling, how are people able to do their jobs, but being able to, even in troubling and crisis times, to spark moments of joy for people where they can truly feel that kind of transformative sensation of this is something for which I was born, for which I was educated and trained. I am doing something good for others, and that makes me feel truly good. And that doesn't have to be direct patient care, but we're especially focused on how can we create those moments of joy for our patient care personnel because they are under such great stress in these difficult times. So sparking joy is one of the big ways that we can help to show gratitude and help to continue to drive and support the healthcare professionals who, again, are just absolute everyday heroes. Thank you, thank you. Matt, anything would you add? Yeah, I mean, first of all, I have to echo what Michael says. I mean, sort of just absolutely amazing um, dedication every day from the doctors, nurses, and frontline patient care staff in, in Mayo and, and everywhere around the world, right? And, you know, I, I think we can't say thank you enough. And, you know, I think about frontline in terms of the context of, of our company, for us, frontline meant the people on the manufacturing floor, you know, in March and in April, continuing to go to the manufacturing site to continue to produce the medicines, right? Frontline, you know, is our medical science liaisons getting out and talking to physicians or connecting with physicians digitally, they can't get there, right? Um, and so even within our company, as I'm sure every company's worked through is, you know, they have a different definition of front, you know, frontline, right? And what has to continue in person, what can carry on remotely? Uh, I think Michael's absolutely right that you need to continue to show gratitude and thankfulness for all those things, basically, because we all play a role. Um, but for us, you know, it, it was all the most frontline thing for us internally as our company is really around manufacturing um, and of course, clinical trials, right? So we tried very hard to make sure that clinical trials didn't slow down any more than they needed to. In some cases, we had to slow down if sites closed or prevented access so you could stop recruiting patients, but as much as possible to encourage things to move along uh, as best it could. Thank you. Thank you. But before we move now to the next segment, maybe I'll give you both an opportunity. Of course, we're talking about pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical and we're talking about direct uh, uh, patient care as well. Is there a question that maybe Matt you will have for Michael or Michael that you will have for Matt uh, based on what you've heard so far? Yeah, maybe my question to Michael is, is uh, you know, if there was sort of one, one learning you, you'd had or your organization has had that you think you'll take forward after COVID, what, you know, what would it be? Sure, I, I think possibly the most important thing for us has been how quickly we've been able to move. So we have uh, a bit of an internal reputation among ourselves as an organization where we need to ask permission to blow our nose and it needs to go all the way up through the CEO. And it takes months and months to get any decision made. And I think we've really kind of blown that uh, misconception out of the water over the last several months. We have been able to get things done incredibly quickly um, and being nimble and agile where we needed to be in order to deliver patient care because there was no choice. So out of every crisis comes opportunity. And I think that's what we really kind of hit upon is, hey, we can move really fast. And, you know, these are just misconceptions and we don't need to 
go back to that old way of doing things where everything took a long time and it was very, very difficult and had layers and layers of committee decisions. So I think you know what we've taken away from that is that that's been a catalyst for us to make changes in other decision-making processes. We've cut days and weeks out of some decision-making processes that we have, and we're going to continue to look for opportunities to do that. So as terrible as this situation has been, we can uh, kind of use the fire to temper the steel, if you want to think of it that way. So it's uh, something where we're making the most out of the changes that we've been able to make and hoping to continue to reapply them going forward. And you get to ask your question, Michael, if you have one. Okay, great. Oh, I think the, the question that everyone had would have for Matt is, hey, when, right? When on the vaccine? No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, I, I would ask a, kind of a similar thing. Um, but you know, as you think about what you've learned and what's been most valuable from this experience that you'd like to take forward, as well as something that you may have learned that you want to kind of leave in the past and would not like to repeat. Yeah, so I think first up, I mean, we had a similar experience to you in terms of realizing what's possible. So to your point, the silver lining around all of this is the scale at which you had to adapt led you to do things you never would have done in normal situations and you show what and it's, you see what's possible right um we've seen that in the pipeline we've seen it in change projects how we work so on and so forth so i think we need to keep that attitude moving forward i think some of it's a crisis mode though right so what we've kind of worked through is what did we get done through kind of brute force and crisis and what did we get done because we changed thoughtfully how we got decisions made and we want to hold on to the second thing and maybe not the first mm -hmm. thing because the first thing is not sustainable um, so very consistent with your experience there. I think for us, it's been very much an acceleration of things we've started. So I talked a little bit about digital. I mean, you mentioned remote care and the, the kind of how we engage with healthcare professionals, you know, how we engage with patients on clinical trials, more telemedicine, more remote. That was coming. It's just compressed that five or 10 year journey into sort of one or two years now. And so we have to scale uh, very fast. And so I think what we'll I think it'll help us accelerate that journey and take it forward. In terms of what I don't want to take forward, I mean, of course, my hope is this is the only pandemic I see in my lifetime, and that would be nice. Um, we've certainly learned how to deal with a pandemic or a big crisis um, and showing that we can do that and we will get through the other side of it. There is life, there will be life after the pandemic. Um, I, I think for me, what would I like to leave behind? It's a good question, actually. Um, I think we're sort of pivoting. I, I see us changing the kind of what it means to work, right? That seems to be a good conversation right now that we're all having, right? We've all worked at home for six to eight months. We like elements of it, but we're also missing certain elements. So I think what will change and never look quite the same is what that looks like in terms of how we work. Uh, and my personal view is actually we need to find the balance of the best of both. I think there's a place for physical interaction and people and human beings being in front of each other. Um, but there's also a place where you don't really have to come to the office to just do your email. You might as well do that somewhere. So I think we have to try and find that blender. So I think we'll leave behind office, whatever version it was, and we'll be in the next version of office working uh, after after pandemic. Excellent. So the theme, of course, as we said today, is about unlocking the truth about transformation. And as we hear you speaking, I'm sure many people are looking for that million dollar question uh, about what does it take for, success, for a transformation to be successful? So if you have maybe two or three uh, tips here that you feel are key to go through these transformations, what would these key uh, be? Yeah, so I mean, it's a fantastic question. It really is a million dollar question. I mean, I've been uh, lucky enough to be involved in many transformations over my 20 years or so in the industry. And I think the ingredients of success are usually quite similar. And they always start with clarity, right? Clarity of ambition, um, clarity of where you're trying to get to. You have to be very clear with organizations um, what you're trying to do. Now, in the case of COVID, of course, we had to create that clarity very quickly. Like, let's all figure out how to work from home in two weeks. I mean, there's great clarity there. Um, but in normal times, it's actually harder to do that, right? To be clear about where you're going and why. And my experience of change is that the bigger, the bolder the ambition, and sometimes the more provocative it is, the more it inspires people. So you have to start with clarity, clarity of ambition, clear goal, clear sense of where you're going. And then the second thing you need is um, clarity of how you're gonna get there. 
right? And commitment um, to really make it uh, to really make it work. We've all heard the statistic, you know, that 80, 90 percent of strategies don't go anywhere because everyone has fun designing the strategy, and then they kind of get disengaged when it comes to the implementation. My experience of change is that it's all in the implementation, right? You have to be very clear uh, about how you're going to actually make change happen. You have to apply resources. You have to apply leadership commitment and focus. You have to hold people accountable. And you have to do it day in, day out, sometimes for years. Um, here in AstraZeneca, you know, we reshaped our corporate strategy about 10 years ago. And we've doggedly kept to our three strategic priorities. And we've doggedly kept to our plan. And that's actually sometimes harder than bringing a new plan every year, right? Because people like a new and fresh. So you have to have clarity of execution. And you have to be dogged and consistent in, in executing it. And lastly, perhaps the last concept I would give uh, in change leadership is you've got to play to win, right? You've got to pick a few things that you think you can do well, and then you go all in um, to make them successful. And a lot of organizations play not to lose, which is they do everything kind of okay to sort of be in it, but they don't play to win on anything. And I think, again, my experience is pick a small number of things, um, either because you're forced to in the case of COVID or because you want to in the case of normal business. Um, and then you really go at it and, and play to win and, and resource it appropriately. So those would be a few uh, quick nuggets um, of, of my experience of, of change leadership. Wonderful. Thank you, Matt. Uh, to you now, Michael. Yeah, I very much agree with what Matt says. I, I think, um, you know, one thing that I might add is that having a crisis helps, right? So uh, you don't always want to have a crisis to catalyze the transformation um, that turns into a very stressful environment for people. But in this case, it, it did certainly help to drive it. So, you know, not, not something we would necessarily choose, but it does uh, help to make transformations be successful because we don't have a choice. A uh, couple of things that he said that I really resonated with, having a, that clear kind of North Star. So very well understanding where is your organization going? What is your strategy? Are you following your two or three goals, as Matt said, that you outlined that you are sticking to that are your most important things? Um, and having that focus and sticking to those things and not trying to chase every shiny object is something that's that's a challenge because you know, there is the allure of other things that are kind of outside of your focus area, but you can sort of twist the language to make them fit if you really wanted to. And having the temperament to say, no, we're not going to do that. That is too far outside. It is out of scope. We're not going to be able to chase everything because, again, as Matt said, you wind up doing a bit of a mediocre job on the things that are kind of outside of your specific focus area. A couple of things that I might add, uh, I think having an alignment to mutual success is something that's important for us. So making sure that everyone understands when we succeed together, we all benefit from it. And uh, not necessarily thinking about an us versus them mentality. You see that sometimes, especially in large organizations where there's almost an internal competition of who can do this better or who's gonna get more recognition for it. And uh, my grandmother had a favorite saying, which is that anybody, anything can be accomplished if it doesn't matter who gets the credit. And we've really seen the, the benefit of that uh, when it's a team environment, when people all agree that this is for the benefit, especially you know when we can align it to a mission of this is better for patients, the needs of the patient come first. Uh, that alignment to mutual success is really critical. And then last, in terms of getting people on board, having a clear demonstration of the value of what you're doing. So showing people very, very clearly, this is what it's going to deliver. And this is why it's a benefit to our patients, to our employees, to our community. Whatever the initiative may be, having a very, very clear understanding of what that value will be going forward and then measuring and tracking against it and being sure to celebrate these successes. This is what we were able to accomplish. That demonstration of value is so crucial for ensuring that not only this transformation is successful, but that it sticks and that it helps to enable future transformations as well. Yeah, I may I just quickly build on that concept of sort of demonstrating value. I think as leaders, we have to sort of show the way, right? And lead by example to the extent we can as well. You know, so we talk about digital to the organization, but we never show it ourselves. We'll talk about the benefits of remote work and yet we're in the office every day. I mean, you have to sort of live it, right? And I think, again, it's really important that you demonstrate it to the organization. And as a leader, you you lead from the front, right? Even if that's uncomfortable, I think it's what's really, really important, especially in this COVID time where a lot of the change has an undercurrent of fear and risk and uncertainty. And 
I think it's very, very important that leaders lead from the front in, in times like that. Yeah, I think one of the important things that we often talk about is uh, getting comfortable being uncomfortable. So it's it's a bit of a trite phrase, but it's the idea that you know when we're in a situation where we don't feel perfectly comfortable, it's not exactly what we're used to. That is what's really enabling us to grow and change over time and to get better. And so it's a situation where, you know, anytime you enter a new role or a new opportunity, a new project, take on something different than what you've done before, it doesn't always feel comfortable right away. And the sooner that we can become accustomed to that feeling and recognize that that's where really the most benefit will come from when we grow and change because we're in an uncomfortable environment, because we're stretching, because we're pushing a little bit further than we have before, that's really what's driving us forward the most. And so, you know, understanding that feeling and embracing it is, uh, is really beneficial for a transformation. Excellent, excellent. Thank you so much. And as I, I was listening to, to you both here, I couldn't help but think about uh, a research that Brightline did in 2018 a year before the, the crisis. And the research was about learning from crisis mode. And we were trying to understand what is happening during crisis sometime that makes organization, I mean, coming out of it stronger, that makes organization going for it. Of course, some organization might not go for the crisis, but we wanted to see what are the key things there. And in 2018, when we finished with the research, there were four, points, four things that we kind of came out with. The first one was speed. Uh, speed with decision. And I heard Matt talking about speed here. Uh, the second one was focus. And I heard you, Michael, uh, talking about uh, focus as well. And then uh, Matt talking about uh, clarity. The third one was about power to people. So empowering your people. And I heard Michael, you saying the, that, of course, uh, in the past, I mean, uh, people were not willing necessarily to take decision, but now it's kind of uh, decentralized, get out of the way, let people decide, empower them to make the, the call, and then moving on. And then the last piece was about communication. So I'm quite, uh, I, wouldn't, I would say pleased because, of course, it, we are going through a challenging time, but I'm quite pleased to see that these key ingredients are still back to the table and, and are needed, basically, to go through the crisis. And the last piece that I think you mentioned at the onset, the, Matt, was the fact that things will change. I mean, there are new ways that people have adopted that will continue on, that will never go back to what it used to be before the crisis, uh, which is quite interesting. So now, of course, as we're nearing the time, I'll give you an opportunity for a closing remark here. So starting this time with uh, Michael. I, I think the things that you mentioned are, are very important and uh, you know very prescient as well at Brightline to have that in their 2018 research. So that's great. Um, but yeah, we don't want to lose the good things uh, from this crisis. So never, never waste a good crisis is uh, the saying. And uh, making sure that we keep that speed and that ability to focus. It, we have to be laser focused on things when they're right in front of us, when there's something that's just on fire, we need to get the extinguisher, we need to deal with it right away. And that facilitates the empowerment that you mentioned as well. So. Uh, People have to be enabled to act in a situation like that because you don't have time to run all of those decisions up the chain. We want to keep those positive aspects as much as possible. The things that we don't necessarily want are the stress associated with it and the urgency that accompanies everything that's directly related to uh, the pandemic crisis that's going on right now. So being able to take the time and have a little bit more breathing room to focus on what is our long-term strategy? Is it still appropriate? Do we need to reconsider what we're doing? Um, and do we need to think about how that affects our tactics in the short term as well? Uh, so being be able to back out a little bit from the fire extinguisher mode and go into a little bit of smoky the bear mode. So how do we think about fire prevention activities versus just putting out the fires directly? So it's a combination of what we want to keep from this and what we want to think about uh, being able to back out once we get beyond this. And you know, again, thanks to organizations like Matt's and uh, thanks to Mayo Clinic, I do believe we will get beyond this. Um, but it's what we want to keep from it and what we want to maybe kind of leave behind. Thank you, Michael. Now to you, Matt. Yeah. So I mean, I think that you know, perhaps a couple of points to make in closing. The first is that. 
your transformation is just change and, and change is constant, you know? So this year we've had perhaps a bit more change than, than you might expect in a given year, but in healthcare, in all sectors, change is constant, right? Technology is reshaping how, you know, how we, how we, how we work. Expectations are constantly changing. It's a constant. And I, I tell people, I talk to leaders often about change and I think about it like a river, you know, and you can kind of got two choices. You can swim upstream against the river and get very tired very quickly. Or you can kind of you can kind of get in the river and, and kind of go with the flow, right? And let the, and, and figure out how to be successful in that in that change. And the COVID, the year of COVID is no different. It's a little faster than normal. It's a little more choppy. It's certainly at a scale that we haven't dealt with as as a as a society before. But essentially, it's just compressing really many things that were already started. Um, and yeah, there's some new learnings from this. But most, at least in our company, I think our takeaway is that. You know, eighty percent of the COVID learning is 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 sort of uh, validating the changes that we're on and accelerating them. And of course, the trick is how do you accelerate them and how do you be successful as companies? And you know, in our case, how do you get ahead of those changes for the benefit of patients ultimately, right? And the benefit of society. Digital, uh, you know, the, the 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 different trends we see, uh, learning from pandemic preparedness. How do we take all that learning now? And ultimately, in our case, produce medicines better, quicker, and, and with better outcomes for patients. So I think that's, that, that's a really, really important point. And maybe just my very last thought is, to end on a positive note, is there will be life after COVID. You know, in, it could be months, it could be years, but we'll be looking in the rearview mirror one day. And I think it's really important when you go through any transformation that you keep in mind that the transformation is not forever, right? That there'll be a point when you're through it and you're on to the next change and you're on to the next journey. And, and COVID is no different. Sometimes we lose sight of that, feels like it's never ending, right? But there will be a time when, when we look back at this and we can reflect on the learnings and we can take the silver linings you know, from this and hopefully uh, move to a better place. Thank you so much, uh, Michael. Thank you, Matt, for these uh, insightful uh, discussions. We really, really appreciate it. And uh, of course, let continue then to unlock the truth about uh, transformation in the upcoming sessions. Thank you all. Stay well, stay safe. Thank, Thank you. you.